Remember, the truth is out there waiting to be found. Wake up. Take the red pill. Join the red pill in the war. Break the matrix. Free your mind. Hey everybody, Red Pill here. Hey, just a little food for thought. This kind of caught my eye. Lindy Rothschild just uh, today tweeted this this tweet here, uh, and as you can see, it says the end of the end is in sight for the machine that changed the world. Our cover this week, and then this link leads to the article. There's a video here. I'll post that after afterward. I'm going to go ahead and read this article because. I can only get one article per week out of these guys because this is pay-per-view content and they only allow you like one article each uh, per week on their site. And I can't just republish this in text because they have this little button here that it looks like it's like it, it'll be some sort of copyright. I don't know. So I don't want to I don't want to have any problems with copyright if I if I copy their article. So I'm just going to do it in video format. So let me read this to you as fast as I can here. The death of the internal combustion engine. It had a good run, but its end is in sight for the machine but end, but the end is in sight for the machine that changed the world. Human inventiveness is still not found in mechanical process to replace horses as propulsion for vehicles, lamented La Petite Journal, a French newspaper in December 1893. Its answer was to organize the Paris-Rouen race for horseless carriages, held the following July. And I'm not sure if I said that right, but I tried. The 102 entrants included vehicles powered by steam, petrol, electricity, compressed air, and hydraulics. Only 21 qualified for the 126 kilometer, which is 78 mile race, which attracted huge crowds. The clear winner was the internal combustion engine. Over the next century, it would go on to power industry and change the world. The Big End But its days are numbered. Rapid gains in battery technology favor electric motors instead. And then in quotes, you hear, or in parentheses, you, hear, see, you see that C briefing. I can't read that article because, again, it's pay-per-view content and I can't get that article up. I tried. Uh, in Paris, in 1894, not a single electric car made it into the starting line, partly because they needed battery replacement stations every 30 kilometers or so. Today's electric cars, powered by lithium-ion batteries, can do much better. The Chevy Bolt has a range of 383 kilometers, which I checked that it's roughly 262 miles. Tesla fans recently drove a Model S for more than 1,000 kilometers, and I checked that, that's about a 621 to 622 miles, on a single charge. UBS, a bank, reckons the total cost of ownership of an electric car will reach parity with a petrol one next year, albeit at a loss to its manufacturer. It optimistically predicts electric vehicles will make up 14% of global car sales by 2025, which will be up from 1% today. Others have more modest forecasts, but are hurriedly revising them upwards as batteries get cheaper and better. The cost per kilowatt hour has fallen from $1,000 in 2010 to 132 between $130 and $200 today. Regulations are tightening too. Last month, Britain joined a lengthening list of electric-only countries, saying that all new cars must be zero emissions by 2050. Okay, now that's important to understand. Because on Lynn's tweet here, a lot of people uh, down here are saying, Oh, no way, Jose. It's not going to go away. I don't think they'll be a come illegal. <coughs> blah, blah, blah. Good luck on that. But they're not taking into account that these countries that are involved in this initiative will impose these regulations and sanctions on people and make the electric car become a reality faster than they want it to be. Um, and that will take place through higher insurance and sanctions and things like that. Anyway, let's move on. 
The shift from fuel and pistons to batteries in electric motors is unlikely to take that long. The first death rattles of the internal combustion engine are already reverberating around the world, and many of the consequences will be welcome. Uh huh. To gauge what lies ahead, think how the internal combustion engine has shaped modern life. The rich world has, was rebuilt from motor vehicles with huge investments in road networks and, invent, and the invention of suburbia along with shopping malls and drive through restaurants. Roughly 85% of American workers commute by car. Car making was also a generator of economic development and the expansion of the middle class in post-war America and elsewhere. There are now about 1 billion cars on the road, almost all powered by fossil fuels. Yeah, they want you to think that oil is a fossil fuel. They don't want you to understand that peak oil is a farce and that its oil is generated underground from and is a byproduct of uh, magma production. But that's, that's a whole other post. If you want to know more about that, you can Google Renstock.com peak oil and you'll see his story. It tells uh, how Russia dispelled the myth of peak oil by drilling super deep oil wells. Anyway, moving on. Fossil fuels. Though most of them sit idle, America's cars and lorry engines can produce 10 times as much energy as its power stations. The internal combustion engine is the mightiest motor in history. But electrification has thrown the car industry into turmoil. Its best brands are founded on their engineering heritage, especially in Germany. Compared with existing vehicles, electric cars are much simpler and have fewer parts. They are more like computers on wheels. That means they need fewer people to assemble them and fewer subsidiary systems from specialist suppliers. Car workers at factories that do not make electric cars are worried that they could be for the chop block. I, that's a weird wording. Be up on the chopping block, I mean, whatever. With less to go wrong, the market for maintenance and spare parts will shrink. While today's car, markers gra car makers grapple with their costly legacy of old factories and swollen workforces, new entrants will be unencumbered. Premium brands may be able to stand out through styling and handling, but low margin mass market car makers will have to compete chiefly on cost. Assuming, of course, that people want to own cars at all. Here we go. So here's the push for you to sell your car and be dependent on the whole public transportation system. Uh, if you ever rode the bus, you know what I'm talking about. You don't want to go there. Electric propulsion, along with ride hailing and self-driving technology, could mean that ownership is largely replaced by transport as a service, in which fleets of cars offer rides on demand. On the most extreme estimates, that could shrink the industry by as much as 90%. Lots of shared self-driving electric cars would let cities replace car, pack, car parts up to 24% of the area in some places, with new housing that let people commute from as far away as they sleep. Suburbanization in reverse. No, that is Agenda 2030 to stick you all, stick us all in little tiny cities to where we go to work within that city and so cars are not needed. That's what that's really about. But I digress. That's again another article. Even without a shift to safe self-driving vehicles, there we go again, there's that push. Electric propulsion will offer enormous environmental and health benefits. Charging car batteries from central power stations is more efficient than burning fuel in separate engines. Existing electric cars reduce carbon emissions by 54% compared with petrol-powered ones, according to America's National Resource Defense Council. Yeah, so that's just more of the push for them to, to make you the bad guy for uh, carbon emissions and greenhouse gases, which really that doesn't have anything to do with affect the climate. We already know that that's disproven and that what's really causing the climate to warm right now are the chemtrails and the geoengineering campaigns that are going on. But they're not, of course, they're not going to tell you that. Moving right along. That figure will rise as electric cars become more efficient and grid generation becomes greener. Local air pollution will fall too. The World Health Organization says that it is the single largest environmental health risk with outdoor air pollution contributing to 3.7 billion deaths a year. One study found that car emissions kill 53,000 Americans each year against 34,000 who die in traffic accidents. 
which study was that? Was that the one that they paid for themselves? <laughs> anyway, you have to laugh at their numbers. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying that their numbers are biased. <coughs> you know that. Autos and autocracies. And then there is oil. Roughly two-thirds of oil consumption in America is on the roads and a fair amount of the rest uses up the byproducts of refining crude oil to make petrol and diesel. The oil industry is divided at about when to expect peak demand. Royal Dutch Shell says that it could be a little more than a decade away. The prospect will weigh on, pieces, on prices a long, long before then, though. Because nobody wants to be left with useless oil in the ground, there will be a dearth of new investment, especially in new, high-cost areas such as the Arctic. By contrast, producers such as Saudi Arabia will, with vast reserves that can be tapped cheaply will be under pressure to get pumping before it's too late. The Middle East will still matter, but a lot less than it did. Although... There will still be a market for natural gas, which will help generate power for all those electric cars. Volatile oil prices will strain countries that depend on hydrocarbon revenues to fill the national coffers. Uh, one note on the natural gas. Um, I worked up in North Dakota for a while um, when I was trying to get my CDL to drive up there. And I found out that they're venting the natural gas from the fracking and just throwing it right out into the atmosphere. They burn it off. They're just completely wasting it. So... There's more natural gas than uh, anybody needs, so that you'll see that that'll become the next uh, the next power generation fuel that's going to be somehow scarce because they're going to make it scarce, so prices will go up. Anyway, when volumes fall, the adjustment will be fraught, particularly where the struggle for power has long been out, long been about controlling oil wealth. In countries such as Angola and Nigeria, where oil has often been a curse, the diffusion of economic clout may bring immense benefits. Meanwhile, a scramble for lithium is underway. The price of lithium carbonate has risen from $4,000 a ton in 2011 to more than $14,000 a ton today. Demand for cobalt and rare earth elements for electric motors is also soaring. Lithium is used not just to power cars. Utilities want giant batteries to store energy when demand is slack and release it at its peaks. Will all this make lithium-rich Chile the new Saudi Arabia? Not exactly, because electric cars do not consume it. Old lithium-ion batteries from cars can be reused in power grids and then recycled. The internal combustion engine has had a good run and could still dominate shipping and aviation for decades to come. But on land, electric motors will soon offer freedom and convenience more cheaply and cleanly. As the switch to electric cars reverses the trend in the rich world towards falling electricity consumption, policymakers will need to help by ensuring that there is enough generating capacity. In spite of many countries' broken systems of regulations, they may need to be midwives to new rules and standards for public recharging stations and the recycling of batteries rare earth motors, and other components in urban mines. And they will have to cope with the turmoil as old factory jobs disappear. Driverless electric cars in the 21st century are likely to improve the world in profound and unexpected ways, just as vehicles powered by internal combustion engines did in the 20th century. But it will be a bumpy road, so buckle up. Basically, this is a push for electric cars and driverless cars, even though they're not saying so. But right here, this last paragraph tells you what their ultimatum really is. So they want the internal combustion engine to go away because they want your freedom to go away because they want you to depend on public transportation and driverless cars so that they can then control your freedom and movement about the country. That's what this really is about. And Lindy Rothschilds, whenever she makes a tweet, it's basically a signal to the industry to start pushing for whatever it is that she says they should push for because The Economist magazine pretty much runs the show. So all right, that's about it for this. I'm going to go ahead and get into this video here, but I'll attach it separately. And then, well, you know, let's just play it here. Hey, let's listen to this real quick. Can't hurt. Okay, that was...
was just kind of stupid. All right, so anyway, that's all I have for now. <laughs> this is Red Pill. Uh, I just want... <laughs> Again, this is Red Pill. Remember, the truth is out there waiting to be found, even if it's as stupid as this. <laughs> now go find some truth. This is Red Pill signing off.